I was able to go into the audition room and audition at the level that working actors audition at. You are auditioning against actors who are walking into that room knowing that even if they get this commercial, they might not even be able to do the commercial because they might have already booked something before they get this job. It's So it's sort of like it's an audition. They're there to book the room. You know, it's kind of one of many in their day and they're moving on. They're bringing in that lightness and that energy. And that's really what you're competing against. Hey there, my name is Nathan Agin. This is The Working Actor's Journey, bringing you in-depth conversations with actors that have been working professionally for decades. Now today, we once again have a bit of a different episode. I'm talking with actor and master strategist Christine Aller about cash flow for creatives. Now, as you've heard me talk about before, these guests can be your mentors, even if you never meet. They've been where you want to go, and there's plenty to learn. This show is all about connecting you with people who have the potential to change your life through their wisdom and experiences, and today's guest is no different. She has been a professional working actor, maybe not as long as some of the other guests on this show, but she has absolutely been a mentor of mine. I've taken numerous in-person workshops from Christine, and I'm so grateful for all she shared with me over the years. Now, Christine is here to discuss a rather tricky topic for creatives, having enough money to really pursue your career. Sure, you can get that stereotypical job waiting tables, but is that really going to fuel you or just stress you out more? What would it look like to have a truly amazing side business that gave you the resources you need and more to fully pursue your dream and to lose the desperation of needing to book a role to make rent? And Christine was in this exact position, working jobs that drained her, and she found something else that helped her thrive. Many of the guests I've talked to, having a side biz wasn't typically part of their path. Gigi Birmingham and Dakin Matthews are a bit of the exception, but largely they came up in a different time, when it was possible to be a regional theater actor and to make a living or to make numerous different appearances on the same series over the lifetime of a show. But, of course, times have changed. So, looking at the path and landscape today, it's about figuring out how you can sustain yourself to keep going while being focused on your acting career. What I love about all the guests is that you hear how everyone has had ups and downs, successes and failures, and after a long time of working, you develop a different perspective. But when it comes to how to keep the money coming in, many of the guests have said themselves they don't know how they do it today. It is so completely different. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. And in some ways, there are so many more opportunities to make it work. It can also take a resource like Christine and all of her valuable information to create that healthy space for you. Now, yes, Christine does have a course to help you with all this. It's called Cash Flow for Creatives, and I even have a discount code for you, which I'll share in a second. But that's not what this conversation is about. You won't even hear us mention the course during this chat. So don't worry. This is not a hard sell. It's not an hour-long sales pitch. I want to hear about Christine's journey and, of course, to learn what she's figured out by helping all of these creative people with their situations. So this is a fun and important conversation about how to sustain yourself as a creative until you get your next break and the one after that and the one after that. What Christine and I do chat about is her journey as an actor and beyond, finding her first side biz and pursuing it, how that gig made her a better actor at auditions, stories that artists tell themselves that keep cash from coming to you, why it's unhealthy to hear stories of being down to your last dime before your big break, 
and because I always have several ideas floating around in my head, Christine even helps me validate a couple of my side business ideas. So you even get a bit of a preview of what she offers in the course. Total bonus. And honestly, I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't tell you about the course at all. It's a fantastic resource, and it might really help you out. So cash flow for creatives. It's highly structured and organized, and you would expect nothing less from a former professional organizer. And as I've been reviewing it, I see items that I learned from Christine years ago that were so helpful alongside all new stuff. So I'm excited to dive in and check it out a lot more fully. It's a six-part audio course covering everything you need to know about starting and running a side business, from generating your idea to ideal clients, pricing, support, accountability, and a ton more. There's over six hours of content, and if you also like to read, there's a beautifully formatted transcript of the entire course, and she completes the whole package with a step-by-step workbook to guide you through it all. You can even check out two chapters from the course for free. It's all at cashflowforcreatives.com, cashflow, F-O-R, creatives.com. This could be a great fit if you've thought about a side hustle but aren't sure how to do it, or maybe you have a side biz and want to run it more efficiently, or you're looking for new marketing and client attraction ideas. Learn all about it at cashflowforcreatives.com and type in the discount code JOURNEY, that's J-O-U-R-N-E-Y, and you'll receive a special discount off the course right now. Check it out at cashflowforcreatives.com, code JOURNEY. A bit more on Christine's journey, and then we'll get right to the chat. For over 10 years, she worked in Los Angeles as an actor, as in actually earned money and health insurance, working contracts with SAG, AFTRA, and Equity. She was a power group facilitator at the Actors Network for 11 years, supporting and coaching over 400 actors. She discovered the job of professional organizing and immediately started her biz, Personalized Organization, as a way to earn money to support her acting career. She wrote the book, Feeding Your Focus, How Creative People Can Move Forward Faster and Achieve Sustained Success. She has served as a monthly columnist for two national publications, Backstage and the VoiceOver Insider. Currently, she teaches the semester-long Los Angeles internship course at Columbia College, Chicago. Over the past 20 years, she has mentored men and women at the top of their game, Oscar nominees, published authors, international experts, full-time artists, TEDx speakers, as well as hundreds of folks who are beginning, changing, or expanding their businesses and or creative pursuits. And every single month for the past 17 years, Christine has led multiple ongoing mastermind groups, in person and online. There's more info about Christine and some excellent free guidance at christineoller.com. Christine with a K, O-L-L-E-R dot com. It was a lot of fun to reconnect with Christine and dive into this very valuable topic that affects all of you. We all need the resources to keep going, and how you bring them into your life affects the kind of artist you can be. I hope you really enjoy the conversation and get something from it, wherever you are in your journey. So here we go, talking cash flow for creatives. Please enjoy my chat with Christine Aller. You know, of course, I first met you through the Actors Network. Uh, I mean, I wasn't in your, you know, what they call power group at the time, but, you know, I I knew of you and then started to learn about the workshops you were doing. And 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 it was mainly it was mainly geared to actors um, at that time. You know, it seemed like a lot what you were doing. So I was really curious. and, And this is the fun part about these conversations is I get to ask questions that I've never asked because a lot of times these things don't come up in conversation day to day of like, well, how did you get started in this? But I am curious, uh, what got you 
well, sp- very specifically to this point in your life where now you're, you know, helping and supporting creatives in their career, but your journey as an actor and creative person. Yeah, it's funny. I, I came out of the womb. I want to act. <laughs> oh, really? That, okay. Oh, yeah. I knew from such an early age that I wanted to perform. And I, I think what that means when people have that experience of like, I known from an early age, what it means is, you had certain superpowers that you knew you could do in the world. This is all instinctual, of course. And then you come across a thing like, oh, look, the people on TV. I think I can do that. What Mm -hmm. is that? And, you know, so from an early age, I identified something that people did in the world that I was like, oh, I could totally do that. And it's so much fun. And I was the kid in the neighborhood who gathered all the neighborhood kids and would put on shows for the parents and I would direct and like produce and do the whole thing. Um, so I was doing it from an early age and I actually grew up in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. but yeah, but I had the two parents who were not in the industry. <laughs> My mom came over from Ireland when she was 24. So she didn't know anything about that she's a teacher. And then my dad was born in Louisiana, kind of moved all over, ended up in Los Angeles, went through the military, worked at Caltech in the mm-hmm. computing mm-hmm. department. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and didn't go through regular college. Neither of them went through American college. So their only thing was like, you can do whatever you want after college. So no, no working actor. I used to put an agent at the top of my Christmas list. I was like, <laughs> I wanted to work. Um, but they were like, no, we're not going to be stage parents or anything like that. Did, did it seem more accessible because you were living in Los Angeles? Like you knew it was happening there? Um, not when I was little, but when I got into high school, one of my well, junior high, high school, one of the, my friends, good friend of mine who was going through school with me started to act because his mom was an actress. So he, you know, he was in dead poet society okay. when we were in high school. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and we did a play together at the community theater, which is a high quality community theater since it's Los Angeles, the Glendale center theater. I've worked there. Yeah. It's cool. It's a beautiful theater. Yeah. I enjoyed it. And that yeah. It was my dream to perform on that stage because we would always go and see the productions. I'm like, I want to do that. And I did it once. It was great. So I knew that there was an industry, but it seemed so far away because my parents were just like oblivious and I was college bound. So I went to college, moved back to Los Angeles because I knew New York was too cold. And that's when I started my acting career. But I did make the conscious choice not to go to an acting school or an acting program because I wanted to just have college. I wanted to know what college was like. So I went to a wonderful theater program in college, but you had to do everything, costume design, direct, like the whole thing, which was great. It was a fabulous education, contributed very directly to my ability to transition and have so many different careers Mm -hmm, in my life. mm -hmm. But I came back to LA acting. And then of course you have to support yourself. So I had like three part-time jobs and I discovered before Google, this thing called professional organizing. I read this article in a, in time magazine about this guy who was a professional organizer. And I was like, Oh my God, that's like a job. I can do that. Mm. I can totally do that. And so I printed up a little business card and started telling people, this is what I do. And I started earning three times more per hour than what I was earning in my support jobs. And I'm like, well, that's the way to go right there. And I love it. And so gradually over a period of two years or so, I was able to build that up to where I could get rid of all of my side jobs and be making enough money to support being an, an actor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then other actors, you know, once I joined the actors network and met all these other actors, they were like, Oh wait, how did you build your little business thing? And so I started helping other actors do the same thing. Sure. And then Right at the start of my thirties, I, my acting career, you know, I was earning enough money to be in, to get health insurance. 
And that was growing. And then my organizing career was growing. But every time I put my attention on one, the other, of course, would languish and then put the attention back. And I, I really had this feeling at the beginning of my thirties that I wanted to grow something. I really wanted to, you know, run as fast as I could. And back then there was no YouTube, you know, you really had to wait to be invited to the party as an actor. Mm -hmm. You, you could produce your own stage work, your stage show, but there really wasn't a, an, a cost effective way to put your own art on video sure, or whatever and, and then broadcast it. Oh, but oh, if I, if there was, I don't know how I would have made it through high school even. I would have just been wanting to be on YouTube, not as a YouTuber, but just creating like art and comedy and stuff. I would have been preoccupied. Your parents would not have been able to stop it. Oh my God. No. Well, I would have turned my room into a studio. Are you kidding me? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of grateful that that actually wasn't available to me (laughs) in certain ways. So I decided to go to my agents and go, I, I, kind of thought like, you know, actresses, when they have babies, they kind of take a hiatus. So I'm just not going to have the baby, but I'm going to go to my agents go, I'm going to take a hiatus for eight months or so. I want to see what happens if I turn my full attention towards the organizing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What I didn't know was, was I really going to miss acting? Right. And what I discovered is that I didn't. And what I also discovered is that once I turned my attention full time to the organizing, it blew up. Mm. And the reason I eventually realized that the reason I didn't miss acting, well, first of all, nobody misses the pursuit of right, work. Right, nobody right. misses the yeah, market. The hustle, the craziness, right. Yeah. Nobody misses that. But the actual acting and What I realized is that, you know, we have uh, our set of superpowers, the things we're able to do that people like, wow, that's amazing. You can do that. And my superpowers, like ability to analyze, ability to understand the psychology of people, wit, you know, all of that stuff. I had those plugged into acting. That's the modality. Mm -hmm. I just unplugged those same superpowers and plugged them into organizing. And so I was equally fulfilled. And the things you get out of acting, people listening to you, captive audience, being able to understand the psychology of a character, being able to change and affect people's emotional lives, being able to like express yourself. I got all of that out of organizing and talking and giving talks. So I was very fulfilled over there in a way that, surprised me because mm-hmm. I thought all of that stuff was only in the container of acting. Right. But in fact, you can experience that in a lot of different ways. And and you see a lot of actors transition to coaches because I think they do discover, oh, this is very similar sure. experience. Yeah. Well, so uh, there are two, two things uh, specifically mm-hmm. I wanted to ask about in there. One, I actually remember at the time, you know, I took workshops with you, that idea of, and you just said, you know, you put your, you put a title on a business card and you started handing it out to people. And, and just the simplicity of that uh, can be so powerful because, mm-hmm. you know, so many of us are waiting for permission for somebody to say, you can go do that thing. And, and taking, you know, having the confidence or audacity or whatever you want to call it to just say, this is what I do. And, and to declare to the world, this is what I do. Like it's a very powerful thing. And a lot of us live in that anxiety of, well, you know, somebody's going to know I, I'm not actually amazing at this or I'm not the best in the world at this. And, uh, and so no, I, I even remember at that time, but I'm really glad you brought it up today that you can just decide this is the work I know I'm good at and this is the work I want to try to get paid for. Uh, and so doing that was really cool to rehear again from you today. The other thing I wanted to ask was how, you know, once you made that transition, you know, from all your side gigs to the organizing and building that financial asset, how that transformed your experience auditioning or, or, you know, just the, the, the bookings, you know, how, how, how that connected. It had, a transformative effect on my ability to earn income as an actor. And this was very surprising to me when I first started organizing and started getting clients and started to earn what's called what I call above and beyond money. 
Mm -hmm. Because phase one of being able to support yourself as an actor or any kind of creative is like base level. Can you pay the rent? Can you just survive? Mm -hmm. But in order to capture the freedom and the flexibility that you really need to be able to function as an artist and function at a higher creative level, you need income that's above and beyond that monthly nut so that you have a little profit so you can buy the, get the better classes and so you can get the better assets and so that you just don't need the acting work. And so what happened is I would be able to walk into an audition room and I was simply there to play. I didn't need them to tell me how great I was because I had clients over there telling me that I was amazing. So I was getting that validation over there. I didn't need the money or the job because I was getting that money in the job over there. And I knew that I could find the roles that were right for me. So there wasn't any desperation of this having to work soon because I was in my car down to my last can of tuna. It was like, no, this can happen when it needs to happen because I got this thing over here that's running. Right. This little, you know, income machine. So I was able to go into the audition room and audition at the level that working actors audition at. Because the true thing, especially like, let's take the commercial world, but this is the same in the theatrical world as well. You are auditioning against actors who are walking into that room, knowing that even if they get this commercial, they might not even be able to do the commercial because it might, they might've already booked something before they get this job. It's so it's sort of like, it's an audition. They're there to book the room. You know, it's kind of one of many in their day and they're moving on. They're bringing in that lightness and that energy. And that's really what you're competing against. You have to get to that. It's not about your acting talent. It's also about your energetic availability and lightness Mm -hmm. instead of that Mm -hmm. tense desperation of, Oh my God, if I got this commercial, it would pay for this or that kind of thing. They sense that. So I was able to go into the room and compete at that energetic level as well as the level of talent. Right. Of course. And so now I was at a higher playing field and that was a direct result of having this little side biz that was, that had put me financially above and beyond my monthly nut. Yes. I I remember uh, it was Dakin Matthews talking and, and he admitted that he has had a very circuitous path and, you know, not one that others can follow. You know, it's just a lot of twists and turns that are unexpected. But what we talked about was it just happened for him that he was not dependent on his acting career to make money. He was a teacher. And so during the school year, he was teaching and in the summer he was doing plays and one would inform the other. And then eventually it just got to the point where he decided to pursue acting. Um, but for many years, he was a teacher. That was his thing. And acting was just, uh, was just part of that. So it, I think it can't be overstated how helpful it can be that your income comes from somewhere else. And you're, and as he put it, you know, you, that you're not dependent on your art to make money. Yeah. Elizabeth um, Gilbert talks about that mm-hmm. in her book, Big Magic. She says, I never put the burden on my art to make the money. I was like, I will make the money for us art. You just <laughs> show up for me and right. I will go clean the toilets and make the money. Yeah. And Wendy McLovin Levy or Levy McLovin, she stars on the Goldbergs. She plays the okay. mom on the Goldbergs. Okay. Um, she is interviewed on Mark Marin and she has, tells this great story. She, she lives in Long Beach or she did for a long time, even when she was doing Reno 911 and all that stuff, oh, even okay. as her acting career was going, she was living in Long Beach and she had this side job where she was doing this work. You know, she could do it on set, but she just kept the side. She's like, I don't know. I don't know when this acting stuff is going to like stop Right. for a long time into quote unquote her success. Mm. Just because she's like, Oh, I, it's a great job. Why would I want to give it up if I can do it while I act too? And I think the, the myth is that the minute you hit it, that you just throw that side job to the wind. But I think you'd be very surprised at how many actors out there, even past the point of quote unquote success, they just keep a little something going on the side. And the great thing about a side biz is that you can make it dormant. Mm -hmm. You can put it on hiatus. Right. And then. During the time, anytime you want to bring it back, you bring it back. 
that's the great thing. You can make it smaller. You can make it bigger. That's with totally within your control. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think the larger conversation, you know, or, or item that we're talking about is that it's okay to be doing something besides being an actor that I think a lot of people put pressure on themselves of they may not have the direct conversation of my art needs to make money, but they think that they will be lesser than if they are not making money as an actor. And, and of course, one of the bigger national examples recently was Jeffrey Owens. Now, you know, he didn't run Trader Joe's, but he was just working at Trader Joe's and that was a side, side job. And, and, you know, that was the reality of his situation was I need to make money. I still act and I still consider myself an actor, but I think it was healthy to have that conversation. And uh, certainly a lot of people came to his defense of, yes, that is the life. Uh, you know, that, that is just part of it. And, you know, whether you take a side gig and that works for you fine, uh, like working at Trader Joe's or you want to start something, uh, I think it's important to, you know, be aware that that is the life that many actors are living and there is no, you know, less than or, you know, that you're less of an artist because of that. And, and I, and I was just hoping you could talk maybe a little bit more about, you know, some of those myths or, you know, what you've seen that has, you know, worked or, or helped actors get out of that mindset. Yeah. And let me just circle back around. I will definitely come back to this point. Um, but back just to complete like the little arc of my story. Yes. So please. I eventually stopped acting. I still consider myself an actor. I could do it tomorrow. Sure. As far as the ability to do it. Right. And then I did organizing full time. And then my organizing clients started asking me to organize kind of their minds. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, you're going to pay me for that because that's not moving boxes. That has a lot better longevity for my right. own health. So yeah. So that's when like the strategy for creative artists. And then I just have done that ever since. And I eventually retired as a professional organizer. But what's also interesting is when I read that article, I went to my dad and I was like, oh, you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to be a professional organizer. I'm going to do this and this. And and his response was, I don't think anyone's ever going to pay you for that. Hmm. And I was like, I think they will, though. And this was before Google. So I didn't really have any proof that other people were doing it, which they were. Of course. I yeah. just didn't know they existed. But it's not that he had no faith in me as a person. He was just mystified that someone would pay for that. So it wasn't like I immediately got like, yes, go for it. But I just was like, I don't know. It's worth finding out, isn't it? So sometimes people will think no one will pay you for that. But it's like, I don't know. People pay people for a lot of crazy jobs out there. It's amazing. It's a very uh, simple quote Derek Sivers has said. Obvious to you, amazing to others. You and you and I are very similar in the organizing. Like it just comes naturally, and you walk into a room and you immediately look at why is that over there. And other people either don't know, don't see it, or they wouldn't even know where to start. Yeah, your superpowers do not feel super to you. Right. They feel like breathing. Superman isn't like, oh, I'm flying. He just flies because he knows he can do that. Yeah. Right. So there are. I, I've definitely pinpointed like about five big stories that artists tell themselves mm -hmm. that really keep them away from cash mm -hmm. <laughs> money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of them is definitely like, I'm less of an artist if I have a side biz. And I think that comes from this mythology that every so often re-enters the, the zeitgeist of like, you hear these stories. And the last time I heard it was one of the actors who later starred on Southland, but he got his break on the OC. He was the star. Yep. One of the stars ben of the McKenzie, OC. I think. Right? Yes. Yeah. And I remember he was given, you know, interviews before and he was like, yeah, I was down to my last dime and living in my car, something right, along right. those lines. And then he got this big break, mm -hmm. but he, but he was saying like, I didn't have a plan B, like this was my plan. And when you hear that story, what a lot of artists take away from that is like, I shouldn't have a plan B. That's how, you know, that it will jinx me. It's all, I'm all in. I agree that you should be all in. You should be all in to having this career for the long term. Mm -hmm. You should be all in, in becoming a professional. And when I think of the word professional, like a professional actor, that doesn't, to me, my definition, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a credit. 
as an actor. What it means is you've oriented your life towards serving that focus of being an actor at a professional level. You've mm-hmm. oriented your life. You've figured out the money thing. You've, you've got your life oriented toward doing this at a high level. So you can be all in, in that way, but there's no shame in having a plan B because my question is, it's beautiful to hear that story when the ending of the story is, and then I got a lead on a series. Right. Of but my question to Ben is, and if you hadn't got the lead on the series, how much longer could you have sustained yourself in Los Angeles to be around to get the break? You know? That's the Mm -hmm. question. And I think that that's what's so apropos for your podcast is you're highlighting people. Your guests are either people who have had long careers or people who you've identified as becoming a professional actor and setting themselves up to have the long career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's that long career has ups and downs and it's about sustaining yourself through that career. And that's what I want for artists. I just want you to be able to sustain yourself until the break happens. And then until the next break and then the next break. Yeah. So another, uh, myth that, that people or story that people tell themselves is, Oh, side hustle. I don't know. It's too risky. It's too risky. I have this, you know, I'm a waiter. I have this job, even though it's draining, but you know, that is risky. I think the risk is staying in that job that's only giving you the monthly nut because what you're doing there is you're going, okay, I'm covering my monthly expenses. I don't have extra and I'm waiting for my, I'm taking the gamble that my circumstances are going to change in my creative career to lift me out of that job. And that's a gamble. Mm -hmm. And the odds of that happening to you are far less than I'm going to start building or trying to build a little asset that I can have in any form I want it to have for the rest of my days. And then I can use that asset to help the circumstances of my creative career change. It doesn't have to change by magic or luck. So I think it's less of a gamble. I think it's less of a risk than staying in kind of those more tenuous circumstances and hoping they'll change. Well, yeah. So what I remember Ben Whitehair, who was a guest on my show and, and, you know, know I'm I'm sure, I'm sure you know Ben through many, many ways, but, um, Mm -hmm. you know, we were, we were talking about just the reality of how often you are going to book something. And Eve, if you are booking a, you know, a guest star once a month, even, I mean, that's amazing, but that's not going to cover, that might not even cover your rent. And so, and, and that's like, that's really good. Like that's a yeah. really good booking. And, and so more than likely you're going to be going through these stretches of not making a lot of money, uh, you know, until that next job or, or whatever it is. And and even then, it might not pay a lot to cover you for a month or longer. And so what you're saying is having this certainty to some degree and uh, having something that actually excites you as opposed to drains you, um, because I'm sure there's a lot of minimum wage jobs you can get that, you know, could pay the bills or at least cover, you know, the basics. But is that going to take energy away from your creative pursuit? And, and of course, and I think the other question probably people have or, or concern is will that start to overwhelm or crowd out my creative pursuits and acting? So I, I'd love to hear, you know, what you think about that too. It's so funny because that was the next one on my list. <laughs> and randomly, you did not have my list before this, no. but that I think is one of the biggest I think that people have is I'm going to start this thing and it's just going to take my attention and take my time and take my energy and completely overwhelm my creative career. And some people know that whatever they put their attention to, they can grow it and they will be enticed to grow it. Mm -hmm. So it might even be that they'll be seduced into just, Oh, they're, they're side biz. And there's two things I say to this. The first thing is 
the key to creating a side biz in the way is to create it in a way where you can grow it and shrink it to where you know how to grow it and shrink it. And, and part of knowing that is knowing how to put boundaries, how to manage clients' expectations, you know, so you're always in control of when you can turn the dial up and turn the dial down, you know how to find a new client. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you don't have to work with the awful people. You can work with the great people because you're not afraid to, to dial it down. Like, Oh, if I, if I stop, if I limit stuff, I will never find clients again. That's what keeps people in the, on the treadmill. I mean, on the hamster wheel, it's like, no, I know how to go get a new client so I can dial this back and then I can ramp it up. So once you kind of have those skills where you're controlling the dial, you, you know, it's not going to overwhelm. The other thing is that we as humans are designed for some reason to be very attracted to structure. So the thing in your life with the most structure wins. And that is why you see a lot of creatives, even with just a regular day job who you're like, well, why aren't you like doing more for your creative career? You just, you're like giving yourself over to the day job. There's structure. You get rewards, you get a paycheck, you get affirmations. Mm -hmm. Someone, when you go there, you're told what to do. So there's, you feel accomplished at the end of the day, even though it's not really growing anything for yourself or doing something. There's, there's these things over here that are far more structured that when you turn your attention to like, oh, I'm going to start to do something for my creative career, it seems a little more vague. You haven't broken things down into a plan, mm -hmm. but if you put sequins and feathers and decorate your creative career so that it's enticing and exciting and you have a plan and you have some strategy and you know, when you have four hours on a Saturday, what you're going to do with those four hours to move the needle right. on your creative career, then there's much more attraction to it. But if your side hustle is structured and, and you have clients who are like pulling you over there and your creative career is vague, then yeah, the end result will be your side hustle will overwhelm your creative career because mm -hmm. the most structure wins. But the antidote to that is you just get help or figure out what, what your plan of action is over here on the creative stuff. Yeah. And it will totally take care of itself. Yeah, and I would, you know, I, I, it gets more into a philosophical discussion, but I think there's also something that he said about, well, you, you know, maybe it even gets to this question of, you know, what are we all doing here on this planet? And it's like, well, if you start as an actor and you start a side hustle and you find you really love that side hustle and it brings value to others and it brings joy to your life and it brings you money and resources and you don't do as much time as an actor or you don't spend as much energy on that, have you really lost anything? You know, it, it like, I think acting is one of those uh, careers that, um, you can get so, it can get so wrapped up in your identity. And, uh, and, and again, this, this kind of, uh, this gremlin of, well, well, no, I, I, I must be an actor or I have to do this thing. And, and as, as you have been an example, and even me to some degree, um, you know, transitioning to other creative pursuits, I think it's, you know, Look, we, we don't know what the answer is to that question of what we're here for, but if you can find, if you can find something you enjoy that brings value to others, I think, I think you're on the right path. So, you know, if you're really concerned that it's going to overwhelm your life, it probably won't, but if it does in a good way, then that's not really a problem. Does that, does that seem fair or, or what do you think about that? I think, well, that was my experience. So. Speaking from someone who fell in love with her side business, oh, it shocked me. If you had mm. come to me when I was acting and be like, you're going to find something you love more than acting, I would have been like, you've got to be kidding. That was shock, but I've lived that experience and I am so fulfilled and feel like this is definitely the path I was meant to, to take. Right. But at the core of this, this was really helpful. My life coach, Lori Johnson, back in the day, she made this distinction. 
And it was very important for someone like me to hear, and especially those of us creatives who come out of the womb going, I'm a creative, or right. in my case, I'm an actor. <laughs> what, what it feels like is like acting chose me. Mm. I didn't choose acting. Acting chose me. And she was like, no, you chose acting. Acting did not choose you. You chose acting. We choose what we, you may not have chose consciously Mm -hmm. that you were super attracted to it, but at some point you then were like, and you, what you just said, then self-identified as an actor. But if you decide to believe the story that they're both stories, by the way, it's right. all fiction. Right. Of course. Everything of course. we think is fiction. So I chose acting. Acting shows me. Well, if you choose to believe that you chose acting, that gives you the agency and the freedom to decide to choose something else. Sure. Without it being a an ordeal. And for me, it took me 18 months to come to the decision when I decided to ask my agents to go on hiatus. It took me 18 months because mm. I had so self-identified as an actor But also, everybody I'd ever met in my entire existence knew me as Christine the actor. From my friends from first grade, like, I was an actor. So I was like, oh, my God, what are people going to think? They're going to think that I've failed, that I'm running away to organizing because I didn't – I'm like, how are people going to think that I love moving pencils around more than I love being an actor? (laughs) Because to everybody not in the arts, there's nothing more glamorous than acting. And I just, it took me a long time to be able to come to terms and, and try and take the risk of having to tell people that, yeah, I'm, I'm doing the organizing thing full time. And I love it. I just didn't think people would believe me when I said, it. and I mm. love it so much. That's great. And, and, I, and I'll just, to, to put a point on this. I just want to mention, <laughs> you're you're not here helping actors transition out of their acting career. I mean, I, I nope. It is ideally no. to help them support their career if they find that yes. path. That's fine, but uh, it is more about supporting the creative actors and other creatives, supporting them on their on their path. One hundred percent. Yes. So what I what I was curious about. So whatever you know about me, I am someone of many passions and ideas and, and craziness at times. And, and I know you kind of have a, a, or a system or a process to validate what could be a good, uh, side gig or, or something to help people figure out, well, that might actually be really overwhelming up front and that might not be a you know, great criteria. So I thought of a couple things that have been brewing in my head that Maybe I'll turn into a side gig at some point. I don't know. I already have six other things that I've said yes to. And I, and I remember I can hear your voice in my head from years ago. You can have it all. You just can't have it all at the same time. And, and I, I think I, I think I, like, you're, you're my inner demon in some way. Like I'm constantly like wrestling with you on that. Like, no, Christine, I think I can have it all at the same time. And, uh, I tend to always lose that one, but. That being said, I had a couple ideas, uh, and you let me know which one you think would be more uh, fruitful to talk about. But one that came up uh, has actually been because of this podcast. Um, there have been uh, a few people that have listened to it um, and have talked about oral history uh, businesses. And these exist, and, and just to give people listening a little context, it can be as simple as recording the story of someone uh, who is older in life. And a lot of times families do this, you know, with their grandparents, oh, but it, you know, it could be somebody at any age. And, you know, I, I think I have some facility and certainly the technical know-how to, you know, make that happen. So that's been one of those things that I've been like, oh, you know, I think that could be interesting, but I haven't, you know, put a lot of effort into, let me try to make this a business and, you know, see if this overwhelms me, you know, completely. Uh, the other idea that I've thought a lot about, um, is doing text coaching for Shakespeare. It's, it's something that I have a lot of, uh, skill in and interest and passion in. Um, and so it's another thing that, you know, could be, uh, you know, something that I pursue, but, uh, you know, I'm trying not to have eight pursuits at the same time. Um, so which one do you think might be, you know, more uh, helpful to talk about to kind of quickly validate? Yeah, it's interesting because, Another one of the big 
stories people mm-hmm, tell themselves. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I have nothing that people will pay me for. <laughs> I can't, I have no, and these are, these are the most talented, creative people sitting in front of me going, I don't have anything that people will pay me for. I'm like, you're highly skilled and trained and talented. Surely you have something. Right. And 90% of people do have something. So that's a bogus argument. And it's funny you should say about the oral history business. Because on my podcast, Cash Flow for Creatives, I um, have taken four artists through the arc of coaching them through helping them with their side businesses. So right, people can right. really hear what it looks like when you're starting something new or, or shifting in a new direction. And one of the guys, that's one of his businesses. He actually has two on that. Um, and it's an oral history business called Lifecast. Okay, cool. That he does. So it's, yes, people definitely do that. And for most people, it's not about the doing of the thing that you're going to do. Mm-hmm. It's really comes down to, can you find the people Do you have access to the people who are willing to pay enough for your business to give you the above and beyond Mm -hmm. money? Mm. Um, And the only thing that people ever pay for, ever, including when they're paying an actor to act, the only thing people pay for is for you to alleviate pain. Someone wants to make a movie. They have a story they want to tell. And, oh, gosh darn it. I have to have people to tell the story. Right. People to say my lines. So I'm going to get these things called actors and I'm going to pay them because I have to have them. Trust me, they wouldn't have you and wouldn't pay with you and wouldn't deal with you unless they had a pain that you were solving. Um, and that's true for everything. Mm-hmm. So it's really about looking at like, okay, What is the pain point on this? Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a high pain point. You know, if someone wants, if is really feeling like their environment isn't working for them and it's too chaotic, they can get to the point where it's a very high pain point and they're willing to pay someone to come in and help them with that. But some things skew more into the, what I call like the luxury category where it's like, ah. It would be nice. Right. It would be nice to have that. Yeah. A day at the spa Um, would be nice. It is not necessary. Yeah. The spa would be nice. Having a recording of dad's arc of his life would be nice. Now, that's not to say that up in in the would be nice category, there are people who want, who have money and they want experiences or they want to use that money to buy something meaningful. So it's a smaller pain. But what you do in your marketing is you just kind of emphasize the pain and the pain in the case of an oral history service is like these stories are going to die with your dad. Right. Yeah. It, um, you know, cause that was been, you that's know? been one of my hesitations is, you know, I see what other companies charge and, and I think their prices are very mm-hmm. reasonable, but it's one of those things of, you know, you start doing the quick math of, well, how many clients would I need to pay my rent mm-hmm. or, you know, mm-hmm. and it's like, am I going to be. Am I going to be putting in 70 hours a week just to make my rent? And is that what I'm looking for? But then I had somebody say, well, you know, God, I I might, you know, they're talking about somebody they known who had passed away and they're like, you know, I might pay a thousand dollars to be able to hear his voice right now. And you get, you you know, it's not about, um, (laughs) I would say, um, really pressing on that pain point, uh, and, and manipulating people in that way. You know, it's figuring out that balance. It's not sales. Right. Marketing is not manipulation. Right. Right. It's educating. Exactly. It's bringing things to the forefront of people's minds that may, they may not be thinking about or looking at it from that perspective. It's not about separating them from their cash. It's about look at it like this. I think that you can set your price as high as you can communicate the value of. So the better you are at communicating the value, which means shifting their perspective around to see it from the value that's equal to what you're asking for, Mm. then it becomes a transaction that happens. And the thing is, is that if you have a way to reaching the group of people who were in a situation where they would see the value of, of having this recording, right? Then you have a viable business. It's just about like, who are those people and can I reach them in, in a way that's easy 
can I get in there? Right. Yeah, exactly. Can I get a foot in the door yeah. and all that? Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm definitely going to have to take some time and, and you know, listen to this guy's journey with, with the business to, uh, just out of curiosity, if nothing else, mm-hmm. uh, whether or not I pursue it. And, you know, as, as we were talking about this, it, I can relate it more to the like, uh, Shakespeare coaching and all that kind of stuff. It's mm-hmm. that, um, it's what are you really, s- I mean, I'll use the word selling, but it's like, what are you really selling to people or, 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 or giving them or offering them or what are they really buying? Mm-hmm. And, and I think it was, you know, I don't know, some, uh, perfume company. It was like, you know, Estee Lauder isn't selling perfume. They're selling hope or they're, you know, they're selling that mm-hmm. kind of thing. And so, I've definitely thought about, well, you know, if you can help somebody feel, you know, work on a piece of text, what you're selling them is confidence, you know, mm-hmm. or that as an actor, that's what you want to feel, whether it's Shakespeare or in front of a camera or, or whatever you're doing, you want to feel that you are capable of, of, of doing the work and, and you are ready to do the work. And in, so in the case, so if we're looking at coaching people through classical texts, mm-hmm. um, my question is, all right. Because within every business, there's niches within the business. Right. Within the oral history business, you could specialize in doing this as wedding favors. Right. Interviewing the bride and the groom and putting, you know, how they, how the engagement happened or how their love story and yeah, editing this yeah. thing. And then, I mean, so you could only do that and have a whole business doing just that. Right. So there's niches upon niches in everything. Right. So in the case of the classical text, what kind of actors are actually doing classical text? So it usually comes down to their auditioning for like grad school right. or undergrad. Mm-hmm. They're auditioning mm-hmm. to get into mm-hmm. a program or they're auditioning to get into a theater company. Right. Those are the two times when it really is like, it's a big enough pain point because you're asked to do it. And if you haven't really done it a lot, yeah. you're going to need help doing it. But what they're, so what they're really paying for is to get into this great opportunity right. that they want. Right. They're not paying to learn Shakespeare. They're paying to get picked. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a question of, I don't care where the breathing, where well, I don't care where the breaths are. I just, I want to get into this program, you know, like that. Mm-hmm. That's what, and, and there's nothing wrong with that goal. I mean, it, it's why people pay for, you know, SAT prep or tutoring or, you know, there's, it's, it's not like, oh, I really want to know this, you know, Pythagorean theorem. It's no, I have an eye on a bigger prize. And from a value point, that's a good customer because they're setting themselves up to buy something very expensive if they get into the program. Right. So the investment they make in you to help them get in is but a fraction of what they're preparing to pay anyway. Yeah. yeah. So it's not that big of a deal. Cool. In that situation. Yeah. Well, I mean, no, I mean, this is, this is really great to, to think about. Um, I, I am so in danger of taking on even more projects that I don't have time for, but I, I will say I finally started implementing this advice I'd read where if you have a lot of projects, you start assigning a specific day of the week and that's the day you work on that project. And, you know, obviously as a result, you will not make as much forward progress on all of them as if you were working seven days on one. But Mm -hmm. it's a way to, as you were talking about structure, you know, to kind of structure for yourself. Well, this is the day I work on X project and whatever I accomplish, I'm fine with that because I know I'm working on that. And as long as you're okay with moving, you know, at the pace you are uh, with all those projects, it seems right now to be okay for me. I'm dangerously getting to the point where I need more days in the week to assign projects to, but I'm Mm -hmm. not there yet. Um, but no, this is, this has been really great. It's been really illuminating to, to chat and, and hear, cause I, I think it is so important, um, for actors, you know, whether they're in the U.S. or, you know, all over the place. And that's the cool thing about podcasts is you start to connect with actors everywhere and, you know, you, you see similar themes. And so I think it's really great to chat with you about the realities of the working actor's life from a, sustaining standpoint and and financial standpoint and and how you can how you can make it work for you and you know there's another um angle to this Mm -hmm. that is not often talked about but i think it's this was something that was very influential with me is that we often have this wonderful notion and it's what all of us want. We all want to be used at our, be working at our full capacity. And that's why we look at, oh, look at Meryl Streep. She gets these big meaty roles and she gets to dive in and research and create this character and then act this character. And it's using all of her intellect, all of her talent. But often 
in the beginning, uh, the roles you're getting, handing your husband a plate of hot dogs in a commercial is not using all of your intellect and skill set and everything. And sometimes you can book a role in a touring Broadway production where you do this simple part or this little thing. And it's great. It's giving you a steady paycheck. It's going to employ you for a long time, but it's certainly not creatively stimulating and using all of your talents. And that's where a side business can also come into play mm, yeah. because it's just sort of like, I love my career. I'm moving forward in my career, but it's just not intellectually stimulating me yet to the full degree of what I have to offer the world. So the side business can also be this juicy little area of your life where you get to explore things and build something and use a whole different set of skills and talents instead of also demanding and being disappointed that your creative career isn't offering you that. Like, oh, I just play, you know, woman number two. And it's like, well, yes, but we want to sustain your spirit during the times where you're playing woman number two until you get a name, <laughs> your character gets a name right. um, and how you can sustain your spirit during those times is to have something else over here on the side that's feeding you. Awesome. So that's another yeah. way. It might not even be for the money. It can just be for the, you know, creative stimulation. Mm. That's great. No, th th this has been really fantastic, Christine. I mean, I really, really appreciate uh, you sharing all this, and, and it was just uh, a lot of fun to catch up with you. So thank you so much. Oh, it was such a pleasure, Nathan. Hey, guys. Nathan here one more time. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe so you don't miss anything ahead. Be sure to visit WorkingActorsJourney.com for additional info and links for items mentioned in today's episode, as well as all the episodes. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. All the links are on our site and in the episode notes. Become a premium member and enjoy additional benefits and perks of the show starting at just $2 per month. Head over to WorkingActorsJourney.com slash premium to join the Working Actors community. Thanks again to today's guest and to everyone that makes these episodes possible. And a special thanks to you for listening. I'm Nathan Agan, and enjoy the journey.